How are you doing? Welcome again to another in our series of video profiles in which we're privileged to visit with distinguished people in medicine who come to the Texas Medical Center from time to time or who have graduated from here, so to speak. And today we're privileged to have our, as our visitor Dr. Emil Fry III, a well-known name not only in Houston but all across this country and the world in the field of chemotherapy. He's to lecture today at the MD Anderson Hospital. We're pleased to have you with us, Dr. Fry. Delighted to be here. What we'd like to do is start at the very beginning, but before we do that, maybe we better get the present accounted for, briefly at least. These days you're in Boston, and I know you're a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, but you're also the physician in chief at the Sidney Farber Cancer Foundation. And Tell me about that, if you will. It used to be something else, called something else, before Dr. Farber's death. Right. Uh, about 30 years ago, Dr. Farber, uh, in the wake of his discovery of really the first effective treatment for our acute leukemia in children, uh, wanted to extend that observation to, to patients, uh, to children with cancer generally. And uh, he developed uh, a foundation uh, which subsequently had a physical facility, the Jimmy Fund Building, and uh, this was known as the Children's Cancer Research Foundation. And that institution uh, was in being until about six, seven years ago, has an illustrious history. Six, seven years ago, uh, six to seven years ago, uh, Dr. Farber, uh, based on the progress that had been achieved in treatment programs, chemotherapy, and chemotherapy combined with other modalities, in children wanted to extend the institutes or the foundation's charge to not only children but adults as well and to broaden the base of laboratory research. And uh, as a result, a, uh, a fundraising and a building program was inaugura inaugurated and uh, we have just moved into the building, uh, the Dana building, which uh, enlarges the institution some fourfold. And we now have, in fact, uh, an adult cancer program. We are continuing the very major emphasis on pediatric cancer. Uh, two, three years ago, Dr. Farber died. Uh, he, again, was the founder and director for some 27 years. Uh, I was named to succeed him as director. The name of the center was changed to the Sidney Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, this was done to recognize, of course, the very great achievements of Dr. Sidney Farber. Uh, we also dropped the name Children's, not because children are not important to our charge uh, and to our program, uh, but rather because we now have adults uh, as well as children, yes. and uh, so both programs are in being. So this was a reason for the name change. Well, now, in regard to Tom Fry, I know your friends call you that. Uh, where did he have his beginnings? Well, I uh, was born in St. Louis and uh, grew up in St. Louis, uh, very happily so. Uh, I, uh, sometime during high school, decided uh, that I liked science and I liked the biological sciences as well as the physical sciences. Uh, and I liked the, uh, the application to man. Mm -hmm. uh, there were several uh, very interesting teachers that I had at the time, several very interesting and provocative uh, books such as Hans Zinser's book, uh, Alexis Carell's book, Man the Unknown, that stimulated my fancy. So I decided that the best way to put all of this together uh, was to go into medicine. Now this wasn't inspired or stimulated back through the family, as I understand it, your daddy was not a physician. No, uh, I come from a family of artists, in fact. My grandfather, who was Emil Fry Sr., if you will, uh, came from uh, Germany, from the Munich area in 1890, emigrated to St. Louis. Uh, he was an artist and started a stained glass window company, a small company in St. Louis. Uh, but one that has thrived and continues to thrive. My father took it over. Uh, several of my aunts and uncles are also artists. Uh, so uh, uh, the initial thing that I was exposed to, of course, was a great deal of art. Uh, I, uh, they finally decided that uh, I did not have the talent. My brother did, so my brother is now 
the president of the company. And you went uh, and the course of medicine. I science. went the course of medicine. Uh, Where did instead. you go to medical school? I went to medical school at Yale. And your internship around uh, New England? No, I came back to St. Louis for my internship. I was in the military service. Uh, I, I was actually in the military service in World War II in the Navy College training program. Uh, then I went back into the military service for two years during the Korean, Korean War. That was right after my internship. Spent a year at Great Lakes, a year in, in Korea, uh, and then uh, returned for my residency in St. Louis. When did you begin to get an interest? Uh, did the interest stem from, well, the treatment side of cancer or the disease side, the pathological side? In other words, when did you get interested in cancer, per se? Well, my I, I was interested in academic things, and uh, I was very attracted to the program at St. Louis University at the time in medicine. I was training in internal medicine, a specialty of uh, medicine, and uh, they were starting a full-time program at St. Louis University and had recruited uh, four professors from Johns Hopkins, and uh, these were a very talented and attractive group of people. I spent a year and a half with them, roughly, uh, in training. Uh, for complex reasons, uh, they resigned at the end of a year and a half. Uh, one of the individuals with whom I worked closely in St. Louis, Dr. Garden Zubrod, uh, went to the National Cancer Institute, initially as chief of medicine, and he asked me to join him, uh, which I did in the latter part of 1954, in December, actually, of 1954. So my career was really not differentiated in the direction of cancer until my arrival at the National Cancer Institute. Now, at the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Zubrod, who had been recruited primarily because of his very enormous talents in drug development and drug testing, uh, which uh, he had developed before and during World War II as part of the malaria program, uh, in those early days, there was evidence that chemotherapy was effective, Dr. Farber's studies, some of the studies with alkylating agents, uh, and the National Cancer Institute wanted to broaden uh, and provide depth to the program. So I worked with Dr. Zubrod on that. Uh, there were uh, many features that went into that, not the least of which uh, was one of the very early patients I had at the National Cancer Institute, uh, a very sick child with acute leukemia who was destined to die in two weeks, who had bone pain, bleeding, high fever, uh, was placed on chemotherapy, and uh, she was one of the minority that went into a complete remission. Her tumor completely disappeared, and that in those days, that was quite miraculous, and the opportunity yeah. to observe that was very major, yeah. and of course, one gets very attached to patients like this. Does this coincide with methotrexate? Uh, this, uh, this was accomplished with methotrexate plus prednisone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the fact that it could be done, yes. uh, even if for just one disease, and even if just for a small fraction of patients with one disease, meant that uh, uh, with proper attention to the development of new drugs, to the basic or bridging science base for the development of new drugs, and with proper clinical investigation, that uh, we could do better. It took us a while. It was Those were very heady days. Our charge was to improve the treatment of cancer, and cancer in those days, the treatment, the systemic treatment was almost nil. And uh, we had many false starts. Uh, we had many hopes that were dashed. But after some three or four years, we began to make progress that initially was, was uh, limited, but progressively became more substantial. And I might say that Dr. Freireich of this institution, Dr. T. Lee Liu, participated in that in a, in a very major way. Mm -hmm. And you've all, at one time or another, and of course the two of them are still in this institution. They are here. Did you all come together? Here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, essentially, yes. I came in April of 1965, 
April or May. Dr. Fryer came about six months later, Dr. Liu about six to nine months later. And uh, so the team essentially yes. came here and that was the start of the Department of Developmental Therapeutics. What uh, attracted you here, the group? Well, uh, the program at the National Cancer Institute became uh, progressively larger, progressively more effective. My role in it became uh, also progressively larger, very interestingly, very interesting from the clinical and the scientific point of view, also from the administrative point of view. And uh, there were a variety of reasons. One is, of course, uh, MD Anderson and Houston are both very attractive. Dr. Clark was, uh, was uh, a very effective, is a very effective leader and was very solicitous. Um, there, the, it was very clear that the National Cancer Institute uh, was off and running in the therapeutic research area. Mm -hmm. And I viewed it as an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to sort of establish myself on my own, to see if this kind of thing could be done in another institution. That's not to say that it wasn't being done here, but uh, it wasn't being done in a way that, uh, that uh, I had wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was really under those circumstances that I moved here. There were certain family reasons uh, as well. Yes. Speaking of family, let's go back to the early days, if you don't right. mind hopping and skipping around a little bit. No problem. That lens variety. Someone in the institution who knows you well has told me that you had an adventurous, I believe, canoe trip one time down a tributary of the Mississippi River. I'm not sure what that tributary was. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate for here, but uh, if you want it, I'll tell it. Uh, in 1943, when I was 17 years old, uh, we decided to take a canoe trip. And, uh, you know, if you're in the east, you sail. If you're in Houston, I guess you motorboat. If you're in Missouri, as you know from yeah. Kansas City, the popular water sport is canoeing. And we did a great deal of canoeing. As a matter of fact, we had our own canoe. So we were driven up to uh, the Lake of the Ozarks in central yeah. Missouri. And uh, this was in May, I believe, of 42 or 43, shortly before I went into the military. Uh, there were three of us about the same age, uh, and we paddled around and enjoyed ourselves for three or four days there and decided, well, it, this is kind of dull. Why don't we portage around Bagnell Dam into the Osage River, which flows into the Missouri, mm -hmm. in central state of Missouri, Missouri River, down to St. Louis and surprise everybody by appearing at the levee in St. Louis. Well, that sounded like a good idea, so uh, we portaged around and we went down the Osage River. And unbeknownst to us, there had uh, been all kinds of flood warnings. Uh, and we noticed that the Osage was kind of high, but uh, at 17 years old, you pay no attention to that kind of thing. We were sure we could swim the whole length of the river anyhow. And uh, we got onto the Missouri River and uh, we floated and enjoyed ourselves and fished and ate in the canoe in the center of the river like Huckleberry Finn and his friends until, it, uh, until evening approached and we decided, well, we better go in and camp. So we went to one side. The Missouri River is quite wide, as I'm sure you know. We went to one side and the flood level was up uh, into the trees. And there were all kinds of eddy currents and so forth and there was no way we could get into the shore. We went to the other side, same problem. Now by this time, uh, night had descended and uh, you don't dare go near the shore of a flooded river uh, in the middle of the night. So uh, the only option we had was to just stay in the middle of the river and follow the lights in the distance, which is the way one navigates on the river. You go towards that light which is furthest ahead and by that you can stay pretty much within the channel which we did and everything went well. The fellow in the center would sleep, the guy in the front would be there with his uh, flashlight and the man in back would be uh, sort of uh, the anchor man. About two o'clock in the morning we heard a roar ahead which was distant and then became louder. We went to one side and the other and I was very sure there wasn't a waterfall on the Missouri River, that is a dam. 
uh, but this sure sounded all the world like that. And uh, it got louder and louder and louder, and all of a sudden we went over, dropped about five or ten feet, shipped some water, but managed to stabilize and continued on. Well, it developed that this is one of those huge log-catching piles that sometimes go two-thirds the way across the river that had actually been flooded over by water. So that was one event that was very exciting. The guy in the middle was sleeping, of course, when all of this happened, and whoops, he came up and <laughs> almost took off like a shot. He thought he was in a new world. Well, that morning, we got to, just at the break of dawn, we got to Washington, Missouri, and to the bridge. Now, Washington, Missouri is in the center of a munitions industry. I've forgotten exactly what it was. But we parked under the bridge, and uh, within five minutes, a police car came up. Now, you have to visualize the situation. Middle of a war, under a bridge, in a munitions area, and telling somebody we were on the river all night. None of that fit. No, so they, that's not believable. And, and aside from that, two of us couldn't find our draft cards, which was your identity in those days. So we were very quickly hauled into the cooler, and calls were made to our parents and so forth. And about three hours later, they let us out. We had breakfast. Everything was fine. And, and we made it to St. Louis, and uh, the parents were aghast. Washington, Missouri, they're not in Washington, Missouri. They're up on the lake. So, you know, all of this. Which is some distance away. Which is some yes. distance away. Well, so we made it uh, with uh, lots of psychic and physical trauma, but we had fun. Right. Well, now let's go to Boston. Tell us about what's going on there. I know you're going to deal with that in a lecture today, but uh, for the sake of posterity, let's put it down here, too. Well, we, we have uh, a number of uh, exciting things that uh, are developing. In the clinical science area, uh, we have, um, I, I might say that we're not the only ones working in this area, but we are working from a different, a somewhat different vantage point. Uh, we have developed new ways of using an old drug, methotrexate. Dr. Jurassi, Dr. Jaffe, myself, others have been involved in this. But we have found that one can use this approach effectively and safely in the treatment of uh, bone cancer in children uh, when they already have lumps and bumps, that is, when they're already considered to be incurable. Mm -hmm. But uh, most importantly, when we use this program right after surgery, we have found that uh, we can increase the cure rate of children with osteogenic sarcoma from something like 10% to as high as 60, 70%. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, when I say cure, one has to be a little bit guarded about that because the follow-up is only out to four years. But considering what we know about the natural history of the disease and the biology of the disease, it seems very likely that when we say 60% cure, cure, we probably won't be far off. But again, that is provisional because of the short-term follow-up. Uh, we have found that uh, when we use chemotherapy before surgery, which is really quite revolutionary for osteogenic sarcoma, that we can shrink the primary, which is usually on the leg mm -hmm. or on an extremity, the arm or the leg, most commonly the leg, that the surgeon, rather than having to do an amputation, can merely resect the area where the tumor was, replace it by a bone implant of some sort, titanium or what have you, so that uh, you have the potential for not only saving life, but also saving limb. Now these patients who get bone tumors are usually teenagers. Yes. And uh, facing a teen teenager with a prospect of an amputation is enormous. That's enormous for the doctor. It's obviously much more enormous for the patient, for the family. Uh, so this, this represents uh, a very important addition with respect to the quality of life. Uh, now that's really just a beginning because uh, this new way of using methotrexate is now being applied by us and by others uh, not only further to osteogenic sarcoma but to a variety of other neoplastic diseases. And some of the results in a preliminary way look very promising.
but it is a program that has required a great deal of pharmacology, toxicology, clinical investigation, uh, and so forth to make it safe and optimally effective. Now, do you project other drugs into the future as far as uh, their use in this area? Well, uh, yes. I think that, that uh, uh, cancer research uh, has, I guess fad is not the word, but there are varying degrees of emphasis depending upon the time. Uh, there was a period when no one believed that viruses caused cancer. Then around 1955, because of certain pioneering observations by Ludwig Gross, uh, and somewhat later by Leon Demakowski of this institution, uh, it uh, became very clear that most animal leukemias, for example, were caused by viruses. And the result of that was a tremendous emphasis on viral oncology. And there's still a great deal of very important emphasis on viral oncology, but it's much more balanced now, and I think in perspective. Uh, the same was true for cancer chemotherapy. The same is true, I would say, maybe today is the day of the immunologists. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact of the matter is that um, a great deal of the progress in systemic cancer chemo uh, in systemic treatment of cancer has been made by chemotherapy. And while uh, the enthusiasm and support for chemotherapy began to wane maybe five or six years ago, because now of new drugs, because of new ways of using old drugs such as methotrexate, because of new ways of using chemotherapy with respect to the biology of the disease, that is, don't wait for the patient to have lumps and bumps, which means metastatic disease has already overtly developed, and the situation is very difficult to reverse, but rather use chemotherapy up front where appropriate against what might be termed microscopic metastases. This comes under the rubric of adjuvant chemotherapy uh, in breast cancer, in osteogenic sarcoma, in certain other diseases, particularly pediatric neoplasms, but probably other major human solid tumors as well. There is no question that uh, this represents a major renaissance for cancer chemotherapy and for the successful treatment of patients with cancer generally. Dr. Fry, I would like to dwell uh, in the philosophical area here for the time we have left. I have heard you say just today uh, moments or describe moments really of inspiration along the educational route and along your professional work. Uh, there is something that must be attractive to the many students that probably will see our little discussion here today. And I'd like for you to talk about that a little bit, the various uh, environments in which you've worked and the various projects which have touched you, and particularly the people that have touched your career along the line, because that's important to the man who's starting out today, so to speak. Well, the people that have touched my career in a major way uh, would include Dr. Zubrod, whom I've already mentioned, Dr. Freireich, uh, with whom I worked very closely for 17 years and still work closely yeah. with in the sense that we talk very frequently. Um, these are, there are a number of, uh, of other very important people in cancer research uh, with whom uh, uh, I have a very important, important to me, stimulating relationship. So that uh, um, to mention, uh, there are a number of individuals that uh, could be mentioned. Dr. Jaffe at the present time, I work very closely with and have a, a good working relationship with a number of other people in the Boston mm -hmm. area. At a more senior level, uh, supervisory level, Dr. Clark, uh, Dr. Farber, until he passed away. Uh, these are all very important and meaningful relationships for me. Uh, I would say the most important is probably Dr. Freireich, uh, mainly because we worked so closely together, mainly because an awful lot of the conceptual advances that occurred, occurred uh, in the interplay in our discussions 
and the people with whom we worked mm -hmm. with. Um, well, maybe we can do now a little bit. for the student. Yes, I'm sorry. The student, uh, I. Th the there is no question that today a much larger number of talented young men and women in medicine. Uh, in the biological sciences are coming into oncology, into cancer research, clinical cancer research, basic cancer research. Uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, the reasons are that uh, uh, tumor biology has become much more of a science. We can ask questions today that, was, mm -hmm. that we could have asked 10 years ago, but we simply didn't have the methodology to approach them. Today, that methodology has been developed. In the clinical area as well, uh, 10, 15 years ago when Dr. Freireich and I, and I would discuss a therapeutic research approach to a given tumor, uh, the number of options one had was limited because of, let's say, the limited number of drugs or what have you. Uh, make that 15, 20 years ago. In the last 5, 10 years, uh, there have been many new hypotheses. and. Um, many approaches that uh, could be taken. And I think that that is consistent with the fact that uh, progress has really been accelerating. It has not been straight line. Uh, it has increased in rate in recent years. Now, underlying that clinical progress, as well as basic science progress, is the fact that things like clinical pharmacology, drug development, uh, immunology is developed here by Dr. Hirsch, Dr. Gutterman and their associates. Um, supportive care, blood product research such as uh, Dr. Bodie is doing, all of this has very major relevance uh, to clinical work and the young academically oriented clinician uh, has many ways that he can go many stimulating questions that he can ask, many very interesting things that he can get into. And that's not only true here uh, and at NCI, but now and at the Farber Center, but true at an increasing number of places over the country. The fact of the matter is that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the number of places that provided a stimulating and positive environment for the young clinical cancer researcher were very few. Yes. Today, they're a fairly large number. And uh, creating that academic and clinical uh, exciting and positive environment, I think, is what is needed, what is being done, what certainly has been done here, and is being done increasingly Well, from national. what I know about you, Dr. Fry, you've made a major contribution to that very thing yourself. Our time has practically run out. I do want to express my appreciation, Dr. Clark's appreciation, Dr. Hickey's appreciation, and even Dr. Freireich's appreciation for you being <laughs> with us here today. We've enjoyed it very much. We wish you well and lots of success in your work in Boston, and we'll be glad to see you when you come back to Houston the next time. Thank you so much, Dr. Fry. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure.